want to welcome everyone to our evening worship. We want to always remember the people that are going to be traveling today. We've got quite a few that are traveling back home to here, and we've got a lot of that were visiting with us that are traveling out to their homes. So we want to remember them in our prayers. I want you to remember your uh, handout you received this morning. Several things in it that are important, as well as the outline of the sermon this morning and the sermon this afternoon. So make sure you keep that and refer to it, and make sure you and it. Uh, uh, you add Annette Parrott's sister, Bernice Richardson, who's having health problems and has been in and out of the hospital all week, as well as the others. And also make sure you add to that the All Red family uh, for the passing of their son in an accident late yesterday, and that's Scott and uh, Jeff's boss. So we want to remember that family in our prayers as well. Add that to your list. There's many things in there, the activities that will be going on over the next week or the month of December. Some of them that are really pressing is, number one, if you plan on doing the uh, Christmas party next Saturday night, make sure you sign up in the back so, uh, so Derek doesn't have to just guess uh, of who will be coming. So, uh, and I hadn't done it either, so I need to remember to do it. Uh, sometime tonight before I leave. But uh, also, uh, make sure you fill out the mystery something. Mystery fellowship to either participate or host. And, uh, and that's important. That's, that's really going to be a lot of fun, y'all. Also, this is important. A card list will be in the foyer after the evening services tonight. Please be sure to pick up cards and a list tonight to send cards to our visitors and those that are in need. So if you would, make sure you remember that uh, to, to send cards to those that are, that are in need. As we begin our worship, let's do so in prayer. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this evening to come before you and to learn your word, to sing praises to you, and to just glorify your name. We thank you, Father, for those that are with us this evening. We're praying that you will be with our friends and relatives that are, that are traveling today, whether they're going home or those that we love are on their way back here. We just pray, Father, that you'll guide them and, and keep them safe in their travels. Again, Father, we love you so much. We just thank you for all that we have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number nine, number nine. He's day out to
gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful unto Thee for this and other Lord's Day that we've had to come together here and worship You in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the, all the many blessings You bless us with daily. Father, the most precious blessing that You have given to us, to mankind, has been our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you brought him to this earth, he lived and died on a cross for our sins. Father, we're so thankful for that. Father, we pray that you would be with each one of us as we worship here tonight. That we will worship you in a spirit, in a way that would be pleasing to you and that we could uh, be a good example for others around about us in our daily lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with our elders as they oversee this congregation. Give them the wisdom and the energy to do those things that you would have them to do and help all of us to do those things that you would have us to do. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you would be with those of our number who are sick, that you would help them to get back to their health, normal way of life. Father, we pray that you would be with all of those who are spiritually sick and help them to realize the error in their ways and that they will return back to us once again. Father, we pray that you would be with us now as we go through the further exercise of this service. Help us to always look to you for guidance in our daily lives. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would... Be with us now. God, guard, and direct us. Forgive us of our sins as I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Number 584. 584. Two kingdoms that I
And before the, uh, the lesson, I'm calling an audible, changing my song. <laughs> uh, then find it, it's right here. It's okay. Then find there is B10. B10. So it's in our folders, B10, with the song before the lesson this evening. Please stand. Please stand. Break my heart. that picture may be familiar or maybe not that particular picture but the the particular tool that is there is unfortunately familiar to a lot of us uh, it is a means of keeping track of what's going on with the heart uh, I think that particular one does an EKG if I remember right or at least it plays off of that and uh, that that's important uh, if you go for a, an annual checkup, health checkup, one of the things they're going to look at is your heart. How's your heart doing? I always get tickled, especially when I was a little bit younger, not too much, just a few years ago, right here while we lived here. I'd go in, they'd take my blood pressure, and then, the, and then they would immediately say, I need to take that again. Uh, because I have extremely more sportsman-like blood pressure, I guess, athlete. And uh, it stuns them, you know, a little bit. They're worried, you know, that your blood pressure's that low. Why? Your heart. Got to look out for that heart. Got to look out for how it's beating, what it's doing. It's the pump that keeps the blood flowing through your body. It is important. There's no doubt about that. But heart checkup is not just something that we need physically. We need to do a heart check spiritually. 
And that's what we want to do tonight. Just think about a few things that involve the heart, how important it is. Most of this is going to come from Hebrews chapter 3. We will refer to some other things to underscore what he's saying. But let's begin with this. Make sure your heart is focused on Jesus. A Christian's heart is only good if it's focused on Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, we'll look at the whole verse as we read it, and then we'll go back and look at each individual word. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Listen to him. The apostle? In what sense is Jesus an apostle? Certainly he's not one of the twelve. He's not Paul who describes himself as being born out of due season in in, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. But nonetheless, he is one sent, S-C-N-T. And that's the ultimate meaning of apostle. Somebody sent you somewhere to do something. Actually, Our young people, when they get old enough to get a driver's license, if mom says, please go to the store and pick up bread and milk and and eggs or whatever, they're an apostle. Now, they're an apostle of, in that case, mom, you know, being sent on that mission, but they are an apostle. Well, Jesus is an apostle. Look with me at John chapter 4, verse 34. This is Jesus talking about himself And what does he say on that occasion? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was sent. He's sent by God. If you read the rest of the book of John, you're going to see underscored over and over and over again that he came to do the Father's will. So who sent him? His father did. That's who sent him. Look over in chapter 5, just, just uh, one chapter over. Pick up at verse 23, where he says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Jesus was sent. He was sent on a mission. Really, isn't that really what he was talking about? When to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus is our apostle. We need to focus on him. God sent him so that we could be saved, not that we might be condemned. But then also, he is our high priest. He's the high priest of our confession. That may be one of the most difficult words in my mind in in Greek to translate into English. Because it really can be translated two ways, confession or profession. Now think about what's your profession. I know uh, a fellow I just glanced at just a second ago, his, when he was working all the time, his profession was a certified public accountant. Profession. That's what you do for a living, right? That's what you do every day. In fact, you know, come tax season, and that's just around the corner, a CPA, that's his life. <laughs> it's, it's all about accounting, you know, day in, day out. But then there's confession. And confession is, is saying with your mouth, you're professing your faith in and your belief in the Son of God. It's what Peter did when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Matthew uh, chapter 16, as, as we have uh, listed for you here in verse 16, he, he is confessing him on that occasion. So he is the high priest of our profession, the way we live, and our confession, 
what we tell everybody we believe in. Look uh, at how the writer of Hebrews talks about him. Hebrews chapter 2, particularly notice uh, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So our high priest is able to aid us. How does he do that? Did you pick up on that word? He's a propitiation for our sins. He gave himself so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. He could cause us to overcome that which was holding us back. He's our high priest. Later, he picks up on that again in chapter 4. When beginning in verse 14, he says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, wait a minute. Pass through the heavens? What is he talking about there? Well, maybe Paul partly directs us in the right direction in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he describes how that he knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know, who went up into the third heaven. Okay, the first heaven is where the bird fly, birds fly. The second heaven is where that beautiful moon was tonight as we came into the building and where the stars are. And the third heaven is where God is. So when Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, he passed through the heavens. He passed through where the birds are. He passed through where the stars are, and he went to where God is. That's the imagery. It's probably the, way the only imagery we'd understand. I don't know where heaven is, but the way it's portrayed there, it's beyond everything that we see and know, and that's the key. So our high priest is right where we need him to be. He's right there beside God, and so listen to him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when he says come boldly, what he's talking about there is you can come with all speaking. You can say whatever you need to say. You can present your problems before God because Jesus is there as our high priest, ready to intervene for us. And then he describes him as Jesus Christ. The word Jesus, the name Jesus, is what the angel told Joseph he ought to be called. Go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. He said, And she will bring forth a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's the idea behind the name Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the one that sets us free, but he's also Christ. And we talked about that already. Peter confessed him as Christ. But what does that mean? It means he's the king. We in the church are in a kingdom. The church is a kingdom. It's Christ's kingdom. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, you'll notice that the Apostle Paul talks about how God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And so we have a king, and that king is Jesus. And we all, then, ought to be looking at him. Listen to what the writer then picks on up and says, Hebrews chapter 3, beginning verse 2, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence of, and the rejoicing of the hope 
firm to the end. So what do we see? We see with Jesus and our focus being on him, we have what? Hope. Hope. Uh, <clears throat> Teresa, I don't have television now. Uh, I say that. You, we can watch a little bit off the internet, but, but I don't get local channels. And, and therefore, I didn't see the ball games that all of you were watching. Uh, but I did, I did uh, hear the end of, of one rather dramatic ball game, Alabama versus Auburn. And really, that ball game, as far as I could tell, was over. I mean, Auburn had put them away. It looked, it sounded to me like, I didn't see it, but it, it sounded that way. But somehow or other, they still had hope. And, and what did they do? They ran a play, which later I, I read or heard the coach say, we practice that play every Friday. Well, you may practice it every Friday, but I'll bet you don't complete it every Friday. Uh, they did in that ball game, and they won. As long as there's still time on the clock, and you've got time, one more down, there's hope. Well, that may be a poor uh, illustration, but it's a human illustration to set a, us into the right motive. If you keep your focus on Jesus, you've always got hope. The hope of heaven. Why do you think uh, Derek sang so many songs about heaven tonight? Because that's it. That's what it's all about. And so we need to do a heart check. And the first thing we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, is my heart focused on Jesus? But then also, we need to check to see if my heart is hardened. Now, that's something that, that you've got to watch out for. Not too many days ago, Teresa's mama had to have a procedure. I don't know enough medically to explain it except to say this, of the valve was getting hard. If the valve gets hard, then the blood pools, and that's not good. That much I got figured out. You can have a stroke or you can have a heart attack, one or the other, because of that. So what did they do? They went in and replaced the valve. That's, that's how they fixed it, uh, to make her stronger and better. Well, Christians need to beware of a hardened heart. And the, the writer of Hebrews goes right into that in the very next verse when he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice. Now, to me, the writer gives the cure before he talks about the disease. What does he say? Listen. Listen. Listen to what Jesus says. Pay attention to Him. Now, he's going to go on and explain, if you don't do that, where are you headed? Hard heart. And a hard heart's going to destroy you. It's going to be your difficulty. In fact, that's what he goes right on to say, beginning in verse 8. Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. And they said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. What was the problem? Didn't pay attention to God. And if you've, if you've read the Exodus, if you've read the wilderness wanderings, uh, or the wilderness experience, largely in the book of Numbers and repeated in Deuteronomy, if you've read those things, you know they didn't listen to God. Everything be going along great, God would tell them what they ought to do, and they, off they go. You know, Moses up on the mount for 40 days, and so, hey, well, what in the world's happened to Moses? We've got to have a God to lead us. So they get Aaron to make one. What's wrong? They're not listening to God. They're not paying attention to the Almighty. And that's where their problem came. It hardened their hearts. And hard heart leads to what? Watch the word. Rebellion. Rebellion. Going against the Father. We can't afford to do that. Not if we want to be saved. And so, he continues in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 
If you don't pay attention, you don't listen to who you need to listen to, what's going to happen? You're going to drift away from them. Any of you ever had the experience we had when our children were young? And we'd say, okay, stay right with us now. Stay right with us. And next thing you turn around, where are they? Not anywhere to be found. What's wrong? Must not listen to me. Because I told them what they're supposed to do. Stay right here. Stay with me. You know, it's kind of dangerous in this age for children to get separated from their parents. And it was even when our children were young. It's become a dangerous thing. What about us? When we stop listening to God, our heart becomes hard and we wander away from Him in rebellion. That's what the writer is letting us see. Then skip down to verses 18 and 19. Because he continues with this idea when he says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Now watch the next verse. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. How do most people define believe now? Isn't that a mental exercise? I believe in Jesus Christ, they'll say. Well, you know how you find out? Look at this verse. We're seeing the flip side of it just a little bit, but listen to it. In verse 18, the ones that did not get to enter the promised land were who? Those who did not obey. And then in verse 19, he goes on to explain, who is it that didn't get to enter in those who did not obey? or who were involved in unbelief. So, do not obey is equal to unbelief. Now, you want to see the flip side. That would mean belief is equal to obey. If you really want to be set free, if I really want to be set free, I not only have to hear God in the sense that I know what He said, I've got to do what he said, because that is true belief. Have you ever had this experience with your children or maybe your grandchildren? Did you hear me? And you know, it's amazing to me. I can, I don't know how many times that I have used words very close to that, and the child will repeat exactly what I said. Did they hear me? Well, the easy answer is yes. They heard the words. They got that part, but they didn't hear me. Why not? Didn't do anything with it. Didn't obey. We've got to be careful and check our heart. Have I got a hardened heart? And the way I check that is, do I listen to what God says? And when I listen, do I act upon it? Because real listening is active in Scripture. It's not passive. Not at all. And so our heart check involves checking to see if our heart is hardened. But then also look to others to strengthen your heart. Are you like me? I mean, some things in the physical realm, I need a little encouragement to be able to do it. I need somebody, you know, to support me uh, in it. Uh, when it came to, to walking, you know, I was, yeah, i do okay today and tomorrow wouldn't do too good. And then Teresa decided we need to get a dog. And we got Bear. Well, guess what? Bear needed to walk. And that big dog needed a, a lot of walking uh, to, to do. Well, on a daily basis, he and I'd walk Three miles or better. And I began to feel better and better. But I had encouragement. Now, in that case, it's from a dog. I'll admit that. But I got encouragement. He was with me, supported me. Uh, if, if I'd run, he'd run. Uh, if, if I walked, well, he'd stay right there with me. If I fell, which I did one time, uh, he waited to, and kind of nudged me and tried to help me get up. You know, he's an encouragement, the best he could be. Well, We need that. Listen to the writer of Hebrews as he keeps talking about this. Verse 13, 
But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How are we going to avoid going into that not listening to God, hard-hearted approach where we don't respond to His will? The answer is we need to be exhorted. We need to be encouraged. We need to be uplifted. Brethren, one of the biggest things that I think one of the greatest advantages to a good church family is everybody encourages everybody. We lift each other up. And that's the image that we have here. Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul talks about it in verse 14 when he says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. That's encouraged. Come on. Come on. We can do it. You know, <laughs> have you ever, you ever been in one of those situations? Maybe you're running a, a, a marathon or, you're, or something like that, and you're running with somebody else, and you start to drag a little bit, and they'll say, hey, hey you can do it. Come on. You know, keep going. You know, that, that may be the impetus that propels you forward and helps you go on and achieve it. That's what we do in the church. Look at what Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, as he's closing out this epistle to the brethren in Thessalonica, he says in verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Comfort? Well, in the margin, the New King James Version, it says encourage. And then it also offers a second definition, build up. Both mean the same basic thing. And then he follows that with the word edify, which is for sure the building up. So you've got the encouragement through what means? Through building up. And I believe the word there is oikidoma, and the only reason I bring it up is because it means build the house. Build the house. Every one of us has got a spiritual house. What condition is it in? You know, I don't know about you, but our house needs continual work on it. There's always something that could be done to keep a house up. Well, guess what? Spiritually speaking, there's always something that could be done to build up my spiritual house. And you all are the ones that encourage me in that. You help me be stronger in my spiritual heart so that I'm ready to serve God. You know, the writer of Hebrews didn't stop with that idea in this chapter. In fact, in chapter 10, I find what to me is the more encouraging, if you would, a set of statements that he makes, beginning at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't waver. Don't become iffy. Uh, in, the, in the letter to the Ephesian Brethren, he says, uh, don't be tossed about with every wind of doctrine that comes along. Be, that's unstable, as it were. James talks about being unstable. What creates that situation? It, it's unbelief. That's, that's what creates that situation. Well, get it, stay away from it. We've already been seeing that as we go along here. Now he says, you can count on him. Jesus promised, and he'll deliver. He'll give you what you... But now watch. How am I going to... Remain true to form. Listen to him. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Provoke. You know, we usually think of when we hear the word provoke, well, if you're like me anyway, make somebody mad. <laughs> How are you going to make them mad? Well, I've bumped into a few people that so prize their car, that the best way you can make them mad, do something to their car. I guarantee you they're going to get mad, <laughs> you know, real fast. Others, it's going to be 
you know, especially, I've observed this especially among women, and there are men, same category, who all you got to do is, is uh, start putting their, their spouse down. You start putting their spouse down, they're going to get mad. They're going to get angry. So we understand the word provoke, but that's on the negative side, don't you think? Here it's not the negative, it's instead consider each other to provoke to love and good works. What makes each individual in this audience become a better servant of Christ? You know, it's not the same with every person. Some people, the way you encourage them to remain faithful to Christ, you find them a job to do. In fact, that works for most folks in reality. Find something that they're good at and make them feel like they're a vital part of the body, which, by the way, they are. They just didn't realize it. And thereby, you can provoke them, you can encourage them to both love, the love of the brethren, and the good works that need to be done. I don't know. I'll be honest with you. You know, this mystery fellowship, uh, that's a mystery to me. <laughs> I don't know any more about it than you do. I've got the same sheet of paper you do. I'm going to fill it out. You know, and figure out what's going to go on with that thing. But, <clears throat> but here is the deal, brethren. That's an opportunity to encourage each other. I already know that. Because any time you're together, any time the brethren are, are with one another, we have an opportunity to build each other up, to encourage one another, to edify, strengthen one another. That's the idea, provoke to love and good works. Now watch, he's got a specific way that he says you can do this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to challenge all of us here to be more proactive about people that are not in the audience. Now, tonight you've got an opportunity. When you go out the door, there's a list of people who need a card. Just a card. You don't have to write anything dramatic. Just, hey... We appreciate you being here. If it happens to be a visitor, or hey, we missed you. Hey, <coughs> we're praying. We're praying for you. Hope you're, hope you're feeling better. Hope your recovery goes well, or whatever the case may be. That's one way that we can encourage each other. That's a part of it, but it goes beyond that, doesn't it? When we're together... When we're together, we build each other up. You see me when I'm down. I see when you when you're down. And we try to build each other up. But if, if I'm not here when you're down, how am I going to know to encourage you? If you're not here when I'm down, how are you going to know to encourage me? Our assembling is first and foremost, of course, to worship God. But secondly, it's to build up his, the body of Christ. So it will all be better. I'll give you a little trick. Besides the cards, here's what I've found. You can text somebody and tell them I've been praying for you. I'm praying for your you know, mom, your dad. I'm praying for your husband, your wife, your child, whoever it is. I'm praying for you. I know about your loss, whatever it is. And you know what? i found people appreciate it. It helps them. Heart check. I can be strengthened by you. You can be strengthened by me. That's what it's all about. So we all tonight need to do a spiritual heart check. And we begin that by asking a simple question. Is my heart focused on Jesus? Number two, is it hardened? And number three, am I an encouragement to the brethren, strengthening their spiritual heart? And are they strengthening my spiritual heart? That's the way it ought to be. That's the way we go forward, isn't it? Can be. So you may be here tonight <clears throat> and realize, you know what? 
I've not been much of an encouragement. I've not been lifting people up. I'm better at finding things to complain about than I am things to, to uh, encourage. Well, if that be the case, it might be time to confess it to the church. Ask for the prayers of the church, like James talks about in James chapter 5, verse 16. But what if you're not a member of the church? Well, then you've got to begin with the ultimate heart check. Have you focused your heart on Jesus? And the only way to really do that is do what he said. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Those that are saved are added by the Lord to the church. Isn't that interesting? Acts chapter 2, verse 47. We want everybody's heart, mine included, to be stronger after we come together. And it can be for all of us tonight, if you need help with your heart check, why don't you come while we sing? The clouds are freezing for you.
Let us be dismissed. O oh, holy God, great God, we acknowledge you as our God and as Jesus as our Savior. And we pray today, Father, that all the activities and events were pleasing in your sight as a sweet aroma. And as we depart this gathering, Father, we ask that you would give us a heart to walk boldly among men, that they would see the humility and love in Jesus. Give us a strength, Father, to resist the temptations and deliver us from evil. And Father, when we fail and when we fail to act, we ask for your continued grace. We pray, Father, longingly for good health for the, and for those who don't have it, that they would be restored. We pray, Father, mostly that when our days are over, that heaven would be our home. In Jesus' name, amen.